thank you all for coming for the third lecture. And as promised, I will stop talking about 3D Euler today and start talking about the 3D Navier Stokes. So, of course, some of the, uh, at the level of the technology of the proofs will be related to the previous talk. And I hope Tristan in the other uh, three lectures will tell you more about uh, the fancy results for Euler. Okay, so, so we have Navier-Stokes incompressible. And in the first lecture we've discussed quite a bit about what is known, and in particular, Leray constructed weak solutions for any initial data in L2 divergence 3. And I will write Leray weak solution. Of course, he did not call them like that. <laughs> and um, of course, the uniqueness of Leray solutions is open. And it's one of the beautiful questions in, in PDEs. Um, we do know quite a bit about conditional results which imply uniqueness, such as any if any scaling invariant norm is a priori finite, then the solution is smooth and unique. Right? So this type of results go back to Foyash and Prodi, Kisilev and Adyzhenskaya, Serin, a lot of people. Instead, today, I want to give the proof of the following theorem, which is joint work with Tristan. And it states the following, that there exists a tiny number, beta, such that the following holds. For any kinetic energy profile E, smooth, C1 is fine. There exists a weak solution U of 3D Navier Stokes with the following properties. One, I'll tell you how smooth U is, and the answer is not very smooth. U is continuous in time with values in H beta, beta is that beta. So it's a bit better than L2. At this regularity level, you may say, well, if the velocity is so bad, can you even make sense of gradients or of the vorticity or, of, or things like this? And the answer is yes. The vorticity is a bit better than L1. So this is the vorticity. It's a bit better than L1. And the disturbing part of this theorem is that the kinetic energy of U is exactly that function that I've called E of T. OK, so. This is the theorem I will prove today. And notice, very importantly, that I have called this a weak solution and not a Leray weak solution. Okay? So there's several consequences of this theorem. I want to state one more theorem before I'm going to discuss. Well, let me actually discuss straight up the consequences, and then I'll discuss a couple more things. So what are some consequences?
Should I define weak solution again? I've done it in the first lecture. Maybe I should define it again? So we call u, which is weakly continuous in time, with values in L2, is called a weak solution or distributional of 3D Navier-Stokes if three things hold for almost every time U is weakly incompressible. So the divergence of U is zero in the sense of distributions. And the equations are also satisfied in the sense of distributions. So the integral over R, integral over the torus. So I'm, I'm considering throughout my talk the equations posed on the torus with zero boundary, uh, with periodic boundary conditions, and the functions have zero mean because the mean we can always just remove. It obeys the heat equation. So uh, u dot dt phi plus u grad phi plus nu Laplacian phi dx dt is zero for all phi compactly supported. And if you want to study the Cauchy problem, you should add one more term. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because otherwise we need to write a pressure term. OK, so you notice that there's two u's there. So to give meaning, you just need L2 space time. We've added the continuity in time um, if we want to discuss the Cauchy problem. And this notion of solutions, of course, the, the first paper I've seen this defined explicitly like this is a paper of Serin from 62. But uh, maybe Pierre Gilles can tell me if this was maybe defined earlier. I, I don't know, but this is the first paper I've seen it written explicitly like this. Uh, Aria, yeah. Yeah, just to continue there, uh, uh, le reste, uh, the type solution okay. is a derivative in L2. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, what is the difference with le reste? Yes, I, I will erase the word consequences and discuss the notion of solutions. So, before I tell you the difference, uh, with Leray, let me mention an old result of Fabes, Jones, and Riviere from 72, which essentially says weak is mild. It says if you have U, which is a weak solution in the sense of this definition, if and only if. And by the way, I should impose some regularity. For this, any LP, LQ, more than two works. But let's write it like this. If and only if u of t is e to the t nu Laplacian initial data plus integral 0 to t, the heat semigroup the ray projector divergence of u tensor u. So if you treat Navier-Stokes as a heat equation with force, then of course ODE says you should do Duhamel, and then you have the heat propagator <coughs> acting on F 
convolved with f. And this is what's written here, just a mild formulation of Navier-Stokes, because f is the array projector applied to divergence of u-tensor u. And this is called uh, the Ossine, or mild, uh, solution. So this is really the same as that. What it is not the same as is L'Array. <laughs> because of two things. One is important, one is I don't think so important. Leray solutions, as was mentioned earlier, also have the energy dissipation rate finite, right? So that means u should be square integrable in time with a gradient in L2, right? Because Leray wanted to make sense of the energy inequality, that the energy at time t plus the energy dissipation rate is less than the energy at time zero. So he needed, or he got it for free. In my definition, I've never mentioned this space. Although, in terms of scaling, it has exactly the same scaling. So remember that Navier-Stokes is invariant under this rescaling u sub lambda of xt is lambda u of lambda x lambda square t. This is the parabolic scaling. This is having to do with the fact that there's a nonlinear term with a single derivative in it. If u is a solution, so is u lambda. And then for any space-time space, you can ask when is this um, behaving like a power of lambda? And this space and that space behave the same, but of course one encodes different kind of information. And the other way in which these solutions are not Leray, and I will emphasize this one, because I think this is the important one, is that they do not necessarily obey no energy inequality. So mild solutions don't have embedded in them the energy inequality. Because if you write this form down, good luck proving out of there the energy inequality without actually knowing um, the solution was kind of good already. And this is, I think, really the fundamental difference between just a, a mild solution or weak solution, however you want to call it, and the LRA solution. And by the way, we discussed this in the first lecture, but LRA solutions actually obey not just this, but also this. the energy inequality, not just time zero and t, but almost every s bigger than zero and all t bigger than s. So it's not just that the array solutions have this energy inequality, they have this one. That you, you, you can look at, you can start at any time and look a bit later, almost every time. Not just start at zero. Um, these two things are very different from each other. Uh, double star is, contains a lot more information than star. The double star is, uh, believe it or not, um, much more powerful. <laughs> okay, so what is this theorem that I've stated on the first board? How is this fitting in, in, the, in the program? So the conjecture, let me write uh, now some consequences. So if I take my energy E in advance to be decreasing, 
I'm able, or we are able to construct infinitely many dissipative weak solutions. You can also improve, you can prove non-uniqueness if E, let's say, increases a little bit, then non-uniqueness. In what way? Well, I can start with any data in L2, prove that theorem with a prescribed energy, the Leray solution is another solution whose energy goes down. They're not the same. Or equivalently, if you start with zero data, the only Leray solution starting with zero is zero. Uh, this doesn't have to be like this. And third, there's no backwards uniqueness. This is an open problem, again, posed by Serin. So in this paper, he asked if those solutions can reach zero in finite time. So you start somewhere non-zero, can you dissipate everything in finite time? And the answer is, well, in that regularity class, yes. And um, you, if you end up at zero, you don't necessarily have to come from zero. So there's no backwards uniqueness for mild solutions. What other consequences did I want to mention? I wanted to mention the bound for the vorticity. I wanted to say that the first bullet in the theorem implies the second bullet automatically. And the reason is, when you take a curl, by the way, I wrote curl because div is a priori bounded. If you know div and curl, you know everything. If you just apply curl here, you can read a very beautiful exposition in Pierre Gilles' book. This is a calderon zygmunt operator on space-time with the parabolic distance. So in particular, you'll get that the vorticity has the same space-time regularity as u squared. If u is a bit better than L2, then u squared is a bit better than L1, and that's what's stated there. Okay. So the vorticity estimate is for free. Now, I want to mention, before I get to the proof, a couple open problems. And the first one I will state is that non-uniqueness um, non for mild solutions in the in the Leray class So this open problem is not the same open problem as <coughs> that one, <laughs> okay? Because mild solutions, they don't know what the energy inequality is. They don't have it. So what I'm hopeful about is that you can prove that the Leray class by itself is not sufficient to recover any kind of meaningful uniqueness. And more, <coughs> somehow a stronger version of this theorem would be non-uniqueness for mild solutions in C0 LP for P less than 3 or C0 HS for S less than a half. Again, this would be showing that scaling dominates the regularity problem and the uniqueness problem, at least in the class of mild solutions. Because we know since Fujita and Kato 
that for H1 half data, you have local uniqueness since the result of Kato for L3 data. Well, it's a bit... For mild solutions, it's not due to Kato, <laughs> right? So you can read that in his uh, book also. <laughs> uh, all right. What are other... By the way, this one... After we've proven our theorem, well, some people got interested in it, and Terry Tao on his <coughs> blog proved that this is true if you send the dimension to infinity. So if instead of three space dimensions, you send the spatial dimension to infinity, he proved that using our method, you can get this result. <laughs> but of course, you want to prove this in three dimensions. Um, lastly, and this is maybe a bit... Uh, These two, I actually strongly believe, are doable with modifications of this technique. The, the C is a bit of a stretch. Same as A. But also with star. This is a bit of a stretch. Uh, I am willing to bet that using these techniques you cannot get double star. Star, I'm not um, so sure about. <laughs> so these are some open problems of increasing level of difficulty. And of course, the uniqueness of Leray solutions is yet another level. And I should mention that... Um, in terms of <coughs> in terms of this, that there's a beautiful conjecture by Gia and Sverak. I think it's 14, which states that not only should Leray solutions not be unique, but in fact, as soon as you depart for initial data from L3, and you just go to weak L3. And what's a function in weak L3 in three dimensions? Think 1 over x. <coughs> that's not an incompressible vector field, but uh, that's the behavior, both at 0 and at infinity, that you should have non-uniqueness. And their theorem states actually the following. Consider a self-similar uh, solution, a forward self-similar solution to 3D Navier-Stokes, which behaves like this. Then linearize Navier-Stokes around it. You get a linear operator. If the spectrum of that linear operator is unstable, then theorem non-uniqueness follows. Now, proving that the spectrum of that operator is unstable is very hard. And to date, it's not known. There is a beautiful numerical simulation by Julien Guillot, who I think is in Paris, and Schwerak. So this is a numerical simulation of the spectrum. They compute on the computer the spectrum, and they get that it's, uh, you do have unstable spectrum. So this is a completely different strategy of establishing non-uniqueness of Leray, and it's very promising. So somehow this is coming from the top by just going a bit below L3. And Tristan and I, we went from the bottom by going above L2. And of course, uh, they, they, they are just different techniques. Um, okay. I did want to say, and I should say it, that in the same paper with Tristan, we also considered the vanishing viscosity limit. And the theorem we, we, we wrote in that same paper states that if you give me an Euler solution, any kind, just Hölder continues.
given a further continuous weak solution of 3D Euler, in particular, the ones that were constructed to resolve the Onsager conjecture, they can be attained as vanishing viscosity limits of Navier-Stokes solutions. So there exists a sequence of viscosities that goes to zero, and the sequence un of weak solutions of Navier-Stokes in that sense with those viscosities such that uh, let me call it uh, u bar such that u n converges to u bar strongly in C0 L2 so in the energy norm in the energy class so all these solutions have finite kinetic energy what they don't have is a finite energy dissipation rate. Actually, if you were to look at the energy, uh, it looks almost like a Cantor Lebesgue function, mm -hmm. except the Cantor Lebesgue function is constant most of the time. This would be the dissipative. Y hopefully, Tristan will uh, mention this result also. That's a different result. Can you make the conversion small in circular space? No. no. It cannot possibly be true because if you have a solution of Navier-Stokes which is Helder, it's smooth. Ah, yes. If we could prove that, um, then I would start with that theorem. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, okay. So for the rest of the talk, I want to mention the proof. And the point is that the proof of constructing these very non-physical solutions goes by actually incorporating something from physics into the construction, and that's intermittency. And Professor Rell knows more about intermittency than I will ever learn. But the point is that if you build intermittency into convex integration, so you then you can, so you use physics to construct via these things a very non-physical object. So the, 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 the fundamental difference between what I've presented for Euler and what I will present now is that I will call this intermittent convex integration. And this is really the technique I want to describe today for the remaining time. I, I want to really just carry the <coughs> message of this technique. What's intermittent about what I'm going to do is the following. The solution that we have constructed for Euler was ba based on adding plane waves, sines and cosines. A sine and a cosine, no matter the frequency, Wherever you sit on the torus, it looks mostly the same, right? Intermittency deals with deviations from homogeneity in turbulence. So in particular, it's trying to capture uh, sporadic high-intensity events. So we want to build into this geometric construction building blocks which are not spatially homogeneous. They instead have very concentrated regions where a lot of stuff is happening, and then there are seas of calmness, and then there, there's another very turbulent, quote-unquote, region and so on. And in addition, the same thing will happen in time. So in, in time, they, they will look pretty wild as well. They, they're not going to be just the same everywhere in time. Okay, so to build... Um, to build this, I need to recall the framework of just convex integration before I can again say what's intermittent about it. And let me start by remembering the Euler, uh, the Navier-Stokes Reynolds uh, relaxed system and so on. Okay? So the goal is to construct approximate solutions.
which solve the Navier-Stokes-Reynolds equation. So you have dt of uq. Q is a natural number, as before, plus gradient of a pressure minus nu Laplacian. So, so far I've written the momentum equation. And now instead of equaling zero, it's equal an error, which is always a divergence of a traceless symmetric matrix. And the divergence of uq is zero. So our goal, just like in Euler, is to construct a sequence uq rq to this equation such that rq will go to zero and the increments will also go to zero. The first condition states that when you, s as q goes to infinity, the first condition simply states that when you send q to infinity, this error term will die. Okay. In the limit, there will be no more error because you're going to send a norm of it to zero. I didn't on purpose write what norm. I will tell you what norm. The second condition says that in this iteration scheme, the increments are going to go very fast to zero. So in particular, you will get a convergent series. Now, in what norm? In Euler, these were C0 norms. For Navier-Stokes, you cannot possibly do C0 norms because again, if you have a continuous weak solution of Navier-Stokes, it's smooth. So you have to go below. And we know that we want at least finite kinetic energy. Because if we are below kinetic energy level, then we cannot even mention the word weak solution. So if U is an L2 type object, what should R be? Remember that what happens here is that you're building a cascade from the nonlinear term to cancel the stress, right? That was the, the, the message of the, of the talk yesterday, that you're, using, you're building by hand an energy cascade. So R is going to be like U squared. And if U is an L2 type function, R must be an L1 type function. And just like yesterday, I'm not writing the time integrability. They will always be continuous in time. So these are always in space. And in time, it's always C0. But I'll never write it, because it's always going to be C0 in time. OK. Next, we need to quantify this convergence, just like last time. So we introduce a frequency parameter. lambda q. Morally speaking, please think of uq living at frequency lambda q and below. <laughs> okay. What do I mean by living at that frequency? Not really in the sense of projections, but more in a Gaussian sense. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the, the main tail of the Gaussian is in that ball. And just like before, I will take this to be super exponential. A not to the Q, but to the B to the Q, where A is huge and B is huge. So there's an incredible separation between these frequencies. If you were to look at this a priori, they would be very sparse. A priori. <laughs> um, in particular, I will use frequently that the next frequency is the old one to the power b. And b is huge. Okay. Then you have amplitude. This is how we measure the frequency of objects. But in order to compute norms, we need to compute the amplitude of objects. And these parameters we have denoted in the last lecture by delta sub q. And it's just an inverse power of the frequency parameter. And beta is tiny. Okay. Frequency is 
Ah, in space. Uh, this is a Fourier in X. It's actually important you ask this because there will be a time frequency also. But I'm not writing it on purpose yet down. But there will be a time frequency which is huge. It's almost like lambda Q squared. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've introduced a Fourier frequency parameter and amplitude parameter. So now let's quantify these two statements. Okay. So I want to quantify these two statements. So inductively, I will propagate three pieces of information. One is that my sequence UQ is uniformly bounded in L2. It's a bit below one always, and you're leaving yourself a bit of room. Then my stress will go to zero in L1, like this amplitude parameter. with a tiny constant there, universal constant. And then, in order to close my scheme, I should know something more about UQ than its L2 norm, something about its derivative. And what I will write is that UQ in C1, in space and time... Okay, so if you think of an L2 object, which is living at frequency lambda q, how much should it cost to go to C1? Well, one derivative should cost a lambda q. But then you should also go from L2 to L infinity. In three dimensions, that costs a bit more. <laughs> three halves and one, it's five halves. So to give ourselves some room, let's write lambda q to the four. Okay? This is just to give ourselves some room. Or <laughs> it's because of the time derivative, because the time derivative is more like the Laplacian. And now you have to estimate the Laplacian, so you give yourself some room. Okay. So throughout the scheme, we will propagate... So the goal is now this. For every natural number q, construct a solution of the system with these three properties. So you don't need any information about the increment? You do. And in this process, I did not say anything about this. So I will add it on this board. You wanted to increment is in L2. By the way, I, I should stress this L1 because this is going to be very important for the intermittency part. This is L1 and this is L2. This in L2 should be less than, again, the stress, one should think of it as the square, square root, quote-unquote, of uq. So if this is of size delta q plus 1, then the increment should be square root of that. So it's not three properties, but four properties that I want to propagate. Now, let's quickly show that those properties imply the theorem. Oh, and by the way, this thing requires more, okay? I will not, I will only construct a, no, a solution with increasing energy, because otherwise I'm going to have to state stuff about energy, and I don't want to do that. So we'll construct a solution which increases the energy. And then the same initial data, it's Liray solution, it will decrease energy, so non-uniqueness follows. So the first iterate u0, just like in Euler, we just take a shear flow. So this is a shear flow multiplied by t. This, of course, does not solve Navier-Stokes. 
if you stick this into Navier-Stokes, the nonlinear term will die. The pressure is not needed because it's incompressible. But the dt will land here, and the Laplacian will land there. So this will not solve Navier-Stokes. It's going to solve Navier-Stokes with error. And this error, just like last time, can be written down explicitly. But now we have viscosity. So, like always, these RQs have to be traceless symmetric. The trace is zero, and it's obviously symmetric. And in order to start the procedure, I need to make sure that these are true. These three RQ, not, not this one, because there's no increment yet. Just these three at level zero. <coughs> For convenience, you don't have to do this, but so that I don't spend much time, Let's set that number to be 1, because otherwise I have to explain a little bit about that. So take viscosity to equal lambda 0 to the minus 2, just for simplicity of the presentation, so that this is 1. OK. What is the kinetic energy of U? Well. It's a parabola, it goes like t squared times whatever sine squared integrates to on the torus. So this is energy, this is time. <coughs> so if the time is up less than a half or something, this is automatically true. Because t will be less than a half, so this is a quarter, it's automatically true. What's the L1 norm of R0? Cosines have L1 norm of order 1. And the only parameter that you have here is 1 over lambda 0. So if lambda 0 is huge, automatically this is going to be true by just taking lambda 0 huge. How about this one? How much does a C1 norm cost? Well, a time derivative costs nothing. A space derivative costs lambda 0. But we allowed ourselves to cost lambda 0 to the 4, so it's all good. So if you take lambda 0 huge, and of course I can class classify this, then uh, I am allowed to start the induction scheme. <coughs> Once the induction scheme is started, it produces this infinite sequence uq. And like in Euler, exactly like in Euler, <coughs> this condition will guarantee that I converge to something finite. So the limiting that exists, u, which is the limit as q goes to infinity of uq, strongly in L2, Okay, that just follows from uniform boundedness. It follows from this estimate, u minus u0, which is just nothing but the sum of increments. So there's a telescoping sum. u0 is this explicit function. So let's estimate the distance from the limiting solution to the original starting point. Well, that means I need to sum the increments. So let's put an HS norm here. Then I'm going to have lesser equal the HS norm here. By interpolation, I have the L2 norm to the 1 minus S and the H1 norm to the S. By assumption, a gradient, I know what it costs me, even in L infinity. The torus has finite measure, so this will be less than 
a lambda q plus 1 to the 4s, because this costs more than that. This one is the increment. I know exactly its size. It's delta q plus 1 to the 1 half. And I remember who delta is. <laughs> so 1 half kills that 2. So it's lambda q plus 1 to the minus beta times 1 minus s. And if four s minus beta times one minus s is negative, it means that this is a geometrically summable series, and I get here less than lambda one to this power. What does this condition mean? Take s small, right? Beta is something. When you send s to zero, this will be true. Ah, it's, <laughs> it's not even that complicated. Uh, what is it? Beta over four plus beta. <laughs> okay. So this is why you have strong convergence in L2, because in fact, you have strong convergence in HS. And moreover, I, have, I wanted to do this bound, this less than this, because it says that the limiting solution, not just in L2, but in HS, is very close. This is a negative number, right? Is in a small tube of width, of that width around my original guy, so the kinetic energy of the limiting solution can be at most this, and at time one half, it's at least this. So you've increased the energy from here to here. And that's, of course, a very non-physical thing to do. Okay, so what remains now is to prove the inductive uh, procedure. First step, like in Euler, is to mollify. There's an inherent derivative loss problem, just like in a typical Nash-Moser scheme. So you mollify. So you recall, you call UL to be UQ mollified in space and time with some mollifier, RL to be RQ mollified in space and time with some mollifier. L is a length scale, it's tiny. I will tell you exactly what it is. When you mollify Navier-Stokes, just like Euler, in all the linear terms, the mollification just goes through. So I have dt ul minus nu Laplacian ul plus the gradient of a pressure. But in the nonlinear terms, it doesn't go through. So you have to commute mollification past the product. And the error is a commutator. <laughs> Keep in mind the circle on top of the stress <coughs> just means that it's not just a symmetric matrix, but it's also traceless. And this commutator. up to a sign is UL tensor UL minus UQ tensor UQ mollified. And to estimate the difference between a function, between a product of mollified objects 
and the modification of the product, right, which is not zero, um, we have a simple commutator estimate <coughs> that the L1 norm is essentially less than <coughs> the L1 norm of UQ times UL minus UQ in L infinity. It's one estimate you can do. It's not very hard. I didn't propagate L1 bounds, so I have L2 bounds instead. I can do Hölder because my torus has finite. So I can put a 2 there. <coughs> so then this is less than, my L2 norm is less than 1, so let me not write 1. And this costs how much? L times the gradient. The gradient is exactly what I've propagated. Lambda q to the 4. Okay? Because again, this is less than L times the gradient in L infinity. And the gradient in L infinity is exactly what I have a bound on. So, <coughs> somewhere I will need to keep track of parameters. So, I guess this board is a good board. Maybe I'll try not to erase that board, even for the second lecture. I will choose L to satisfy two things. One is that that thing is tiny. How do I quantify tiny? <laughs> it's an inverse power of the next frequency. Alpha is yet another parameter. It's a tiny parameter but it's of the next frequency, that's very important. And moreover, during this mollification, I also need to be careful because accidentally, I don't want to mollify at such a small scale that I've already gone beyond my next frequency. So L inverse can't be too large. So let's make it large, but not too large. <laughs> Two alpha, the same alpha. Alpha is a tiny number. But keep in mind, this number b is huge. So because of this relation, <coughs> something which has the index q is absolutely destroyed by anything which has the index q plus one. Because I can make b huge. Okay, so whenever you see something with index Q or L, for that matter, it can be completely annihilated by Q plus one. Okay, so then, and I think I'll write one more line and then we take a break. We have this equation. But we want to get to this equation with Q replaced by Q plus one because that's the inductive procedure, right? So you declare WQ plus one to be this increment. So I want to get here, so I'm gonna add to this guy a perturbation. What does this perturbation obey? DT WQ plus one, and I'm gonna arrange terms in a very funny way. And I will only be able to explain this arrangement in the second lecture. Then I have here all the linear terms. Plus some kind of pressure term. The pressure is irrelevant equals the new stress. And there's somewhere our, this guy. <coughs> Where should I write the irrelevant thing? This is irrelevant. The commutator stress, which is here, due to our choice of L, 
already obeys this bound with q replaced by q plus 1. So this is already much less, in fact. So this is already done. I don't have to do anything with it. So just like in Euler, the game is design wq plus 1 with this constraint. So we need I need a half because I went from uq to ul, that's a half, and now from ul to uq plus 1, another half. Design wq plus 1 such that given an error, I will get another error, which is smaller. So in some sense, ideally, <laughs> you would solve this is equal to 0. And then you would be done. Turns out that you can do that for short time but not for a long time. And the amount of time you can do that for is very tiny. So instead, we're going to do something very different. And this very different thing will be called, so it's, we're going to construct as a superposition of what we call intermittent jets. And I'll tell you what they are. Um, they're very beautiful, uh, explicit things uh, in which there's a network of pipes in the torus and there's water flowing through these pipes at some incredible speed in a very precise geometric arrangement. So I, in the next hour, after we take a short break, I will convince you, first of all, what kind of object do I need? And then I'm going to prove that the object exists. And that object will be called an intermittent jet. And I should add that this intermittent jets, we wrote them not in the paper with Tristan, but in another joint paper with Tristan and with Maria Colombo. So in that paper with Maria Colombo, where we also proved partial regularity in time, this is where these intermittent jets are defined. Okay, so let's take a quick break. All right, so we are left on that board, and it's the same as in Euler so far, except there's one more term, and I've arranged the terms on, on the line in a different way. That's all so far. So what we did next in Euler, we wrote the linear algebra lemma. So this time, let's write the original lemma written by Nash. Uh, in which he, which he used for the asymmetric embedding problem. And it basically says that uh, stresses can be spanned by primitive metrics. So let me just write this down. There exists a set, lambda. There exist many sets, but I will need just one, uh, which is on the unit sphere with rational entries. And for all elements in this set, which I'm going to call xi, I have a smooth function gamma xi defined in the ball of radius one half around the identity in the space of symmetric matrices. You actually just need a positive matrix. You don't need to be in the ball of radius one half. You just need a positive matrix. Uh, such that <coughs> M, any matrix in that set, can be written as this sum. So the only thing that's different from the lemma for Euler is that this is xi tensor xi as opposed to the identity matrix minus that. Okay. This is a primitive matrix, which is a vector tensor itself. Okay, so that means that when we design the principal part of the perturbation, just like in Euler, we have some amplitudes 
which we're going to construct in terms of the old stress. And then we have some vectors, which we will want to point in the direction of Xi, because we want from U tensor U to get Xi tensor Xi. So instead of writing a general vector which points in the direction Xi, let me write Xi times a scalar function. So this is a scalar function, and it's fast. This is the slow part, and this is... Um, okay. So if this is true, if this is my ansatz, then of course The tensor product of the principal part of the correction should be a double sum. But I will insist that these bump functions W xi have this joint support. is empty, I'm just going to require this for the sake of it. They're going to have this joint support, so when I multiply, I actually get a single sum. It makes bookkeeping a bit easier. It's not fundamental. So then I get xi tensor xi and the square of that bump function. Okay, so remember that we want this quadratic form, wq plus 1 tensor wq plus 1, to cancel RL. And this is going to be a slow object. But here I have a fast object. So in what's the slow part of it? The slow part is the mean. And in order for me to apply this lemma, it's very convenient to set the mean to be 1. Okay. It's going to be 7 of them. <laughs> Now, if you have a bump function, just let's think of this w as a bump function. If I have a bump function and I square it, I still get a bump function, right? Uh, I will have to make it periodic because I'm working on the torus after all. So when you subtract from a bump function its mean, and again, it's periodic, what frequency does this object live at? And I guess it depends, right? If you think of... Um, you know, just sine sigma x, this is a periodic thing, and you square it, and you subtract its mean, you get cosine uh, of 2 sigma x, so it's related to sigma. But this is if it has one mode. What if it has many modes? Bump functions tend to have many modes, <laughs> not one mode. So, let me put as a requirement that W xi is periodic at some scale I will tell you what sigma is, but what should I want from sigma? This somehow is slow, it has frequency related to L so I want the period of this to be higher than L. Okay. 
Actually, if you make it much bigger than L to the 5, then I can put a constant there. It doesn't matter, okay? It's, it's going to be very fast. In particular, lambda q plus 1 will do. If sigma is lambda q plus 1, that's going to destroy any L. But if it's lambda q plus 1 to the power 1 over 10, it's also going to destroy any L. Because L has this alpha there, and if I make alpha less than 1 over 20, you know. So sigma will be something like lambda q plus 1 to the 1 over 10. Uh, I'm, I'm ignoring a minus sign. Sorry about that. <laughs> and of course, you can't have this period to be larger than lambda q plus 1. Because otherwise you've exceeded your next frequency. The next property you would maybe want is that your perturbation is not faster than the next frequency available, which is lambda q plus 1. So maybe what you want is that every single gradient hitting on this bump costs at most lambda q plus 1. Times a constant. The constant has to do with exactly how I normalized things. So because I've normalized it in L2, I can put L2 norm here. But you know what I mean. Every derivative should cost at most that much. The other thing is that if I want this to be incompressible, then when I take the divergence, to leading order it's going to land on the fast object. Right? And the divergence of xi times a bump function, it's xi dot grad. So if I want this to be leading order incompressible, I will need that xi dot grad is small. So what does it mean small compared to what? That the divergence is much smaller than the curl. That's what it means to be roughly incompressible. Okay, so I will want that the divergence and I'm going to put this in quotations, the divergence of xi w xi, which is nothing but xi dot grad, is much smaller than the curl. If this is true, then I can add a small perturbation to make it incompressible. If it's not true, I cannot make it incompressible with a small perturbation. I would need a large perturbation. So keep in mind, this is never incompressible, the principal part. You need to make it incompressible by adding a tiny thing. And how tiny that object is, it's going to be the quotient. Okay. Now, let's go back here. This is now 1. So we would like to cancel RL, right? So that means we should define these amplitudes in terms of these functions gamma. Now, what's different in Navier-Stokes and in Euler? In Euler, RL was naturally a C0 object. So it means I know everywhere in space how big it is, and I can naturally define a square root of it. But here, RL is naturally an L1 object. It is actually C0 because I've mollified it, but the bounds which are good are L1 bounds. Mm -hmm. So that means it's not the same everywhere. So how I cut it starts to actually matter. So it's useful to think of this as square root of RL in terms of estimates. Every single estimate I'm going to prove is the same estimate for square root of RL, except what exactly do I mean by that, <laughs> right? RL is not positive. I mean, what, what do I mean by this? So, okay. So to define the amplitudes, you introduce a function rho of xt, 
which is trying to mimic the square root function. So it's a constant related to that constant. Let's actually write it, because <laughs> then... Uh, so that c is that c. Delta q plus 1 chi of rl divided by c delta q plus 1, where chi is a smoothened out um, function So what is this rho? <laughs> rho is now, because I've avoided zero, right? When you take derivatives of square root, you, you're worried about zero. Chi is never zero, okay? So I've, I've somehow removed the zero. Also rho has LP norms. When RL is much less than this, by the way, why did I divide by this? Because that's exactly, what it's what is there so inside of the parentheses i have a unit size l1 function so this unit size at one function could either be small and that says chi spits out one and then the lp norm will be just delta q plus one because it's a constant or it spits out that guy itself in which case these deltas cancel and i get the lp norm of rl So rho is something which has the same LP norms as R, but it doesn't have the issues near R is equal to zero. And then, once I have this rho, I can really tell you who A, who the A's are. A psi of RL is nothing but rho to the one half, these gammas, of identity minus RL divided by rho. Why did I do this? Besides this beautiful property, rho has another beautiful property that <coughs> when you divide RL by rho, you see RL divided by rho, essentially, this is pointwise less than a half. I, I started with an L1 function. I cooked up another L1 function, which is that one. And it's at least twice as big, always. That means that this object is going to be in the ball of radius one half around the identity. So that means I'm allowed to plug in those matrices. And this is the proper renormalization because now this term which is underlined there, becomes this. So A squared will mean rho times gamma squared. Gamma squared will give me back the matrix, so I should get rho times the matrix. So it's rho times which matrix? This one. And voila, you've cancelled RL modulo uh, and I multiple of the identity, which you're going to hide in the pressure anyway. It's not zero. Rho depends on X and T. You're really changing the pressure in a non-trivial way. Okay, so that's settled. Now comes something a bit more interesting, I want my perturbation to obey that estimate. Its L2 norm should be of size delta Q plus 1 to the 1 half. The L2 norm of this is the L2 norm of this product.
And these I've normalized in L2 to be 1, so you're very tempted to put L2 L infinity. What's the L infinity norm of A? <coughs> this is an order 1 object, so the L infinity norm is the L infinity norm of rho to the 1 half. What is rho in L infinity? Delta Q plus 1 times RL in L infinity. That I don't have access to. I had access to RL in L1. So it seems that there's a fundamental issue. Either I've normalized in the wrong way, but then you will discover I have other issues, because then the number 1, which I have written here, wouldn't be the number 1, and then I have a much bigger problem. Or I should not do Helder. And the answer is you should not do Helder. <laughs> because whenever you multiply a slow times a fast object, I guess this is a lesson for the younger people in the audience, never apply Helder. <laughs> it's a loss. It's a huge loss. So how much does the gradient cost on A? So A, <coughs> first of all, it has a size. In L2, the size of A in L2 is like rho in L1. Right? Just because of this. What is rho in L1? This plus this in L1. So it's both of size delta Q plus 1. So this has a certain L2 norm, and that quantifies its amplitude. Now, how fast is it? How much does the gradient on Ixi costs? How much does it cost, every single gradient? Well, you can hit the gradient here or there. If it falls on RL, it costs an L inverse. How about if it falls on rho? Well, if it falls on rho, it also costs something related to L. Okay? There's all sorts of square roots, there's divisions, unpleasant stuff. It costs at most L to the minus 5. <laughs> okay? Which is why <laughs> I have written this. This is some algebra. I'm not going to do it because uh, I'm going to embarrass myself. So, you have a function which technically oscillates at frequencies below L to the minus 5. And you're multiplying it with a <coughs> torus divided by sigma periodic function, where sigma is much more than this theorem. And this is a, we call it the decoupling lemma. You may call it the homogenization lemma. This is actually less than the L2 norm of this times the L2 norm of that. Fake Helder. And the one comes from the fact that I've normalized my L2 norm. And I forgot the one half somewhere, right? There. <coughs> so, actually, because of this decoupling lemma, which says that slow times fast obeys strange Helder, which is, we actually will be in business. If whatever I'm adding, namely the incompressibility corrector and whatever else I'm going to add is smaller, then I'm going to be okay. And again, because of this, the incompressibility corrector will be smaller. What's next? Let's try to estimate the Laplacian, because we've never really discussed anything about the Laplacian. So let's try to look at this term and see what is its contribution <coughs> to the divergence of RQ plus 1. So I need inverse divergence of Laplacian of the principal part of the perturbation. Inverse Laplacian, sorry, inverse divergence of the Laplacian is also known as the gradient. <laughs> um, 
and right. And in what norm do we estimate this in? It's a stress. All stresses are in L1. And this is a key thing. This is naturally an L2 object, but we're estimating it in L1. That should ring some kind of bell. So this is, of course, roughly the same as the gradient in L1. And when the gradient hits on the product, it costs more when it hits the fast guy. And because of this property, it costs exactly lambda q plus 1. So this is going to be less than sum over xi lambda q plus 1. The L1 norm of this, again, I have my fake L, fake uh, Helder inequality. And the L1 norm of prime, whatever that means. <laughs> okay. All right, so what is the L1 norm of A? A is naturally an L2 object. I don't have access to its L1 norm because I don't have access to the L1 half norm of R. There is no such thing. So I'm just going to do Helder. This is a bump function which is normalized in L2. So when I try to estimate, when you take a derivative, it's still a bump. When you try to estimate it, the difference between the L1 norm and the L2 norm should be related to the size of the support. Helder says it should be the size, the Lebesgue measure, of the support to the power one half. times 1, or something of order 1. And what do we want? We want this to be less than that. Now you can unpack what this means. And what this will mean is that W Xi is more than 2d thin. Meaning, the Lebesgue measure of its support of a single bump is much less than lambda q plus 1 to the minus 2. Why minus 2? Because I'm going to take the power 1 half here and I need to beat this guy. But in addition, I need to also get below there. So I need to add the minus epsilon for some epsilon. I think it's 4 beta b if I do the computation, or beta b squared, something like this. No, it's 4 beta b actually. So. This is the key point of all of this. The building block has to be, what do I call it, more than 2D thin. If you imagine something which is a tube that has a long axis and two small axes, because of condition 4, these small axes can be not more than lambda q plus 1 inverse. So the total measure of this long tube will be lambda q plus 1 to the minus 2, and not better. If you think of a ball, where the radius is related to lambda q plus 1 to the minus 1, then this is cubically small. What you require here is more than 2d, and the emphasis is on more. Okay. <coughs> so this will be true if I succeed in getting 6. 
because whatever epsilon I get, I will make beta to be so tiny that I can go below that epsilon. Okay, so that looks very promising. What else do we need? Oh, by the way, I'm not going to write this, but we've estimated this in L1. You should believe me that these in L1 are much smaller because you didn't even pay a gradient, right? Inverse divergence here is a gradient. The gradient costs a lot. Multiplication by this costs nothing. So this is incredibly much larger than that. So if I succeed in doing this, we have killed the entire line there. So what's left? Well, dt and the divergence hitting this at high frequency, namely the divergence landing there. What was the lesson learned from Euler? The lesson learned from Euler was that if I want this high order oscillation error to not matter, I should ensure, by the way, when the divergence hits, it kills the mean anyway. Right? So what I should want is that the divergence of Xi to be roughly a pressure gradient. <laughs> That's the lesson we have from Euler. And by equal, I mean up to small error. Okay, if you succeed with this, then you know that there's not much, there's no fundamental enemy left, and then you're hopeful. So now you ask the question, does there exist an object with these seven properties? So, some kind of nice normalization property, support properties, some periodicity, roughly incompressible, this says the frequency, solves stationary Euler, and is more than 2D thin. And the conjecture I have, and I think Tristan agrees, and this is a beautiful Liouville theorem waiting to be proven by somebody, that this is the empty set. Uh, I should add that I want this, so with this Xi, right? Because I also need to span matrices, right? Uh, I really need these directions to span matrices. So, um, so let me write a family to emphasize that I need six of them. And the reason that this doesn't exist are these two properties. If I erase either one of them, it's very easy to construct an object. If I erase the last one, <laughs> I just take a bump function supported in a ball. It's going to obey all properties. How about if I erase six but keep seven? And that was known, that if you erase keep six but keep seven, such an object was known and these are the Mikado flows of uh, Sara Daneri and Laszlo Sekehidi. <coughs> I was trying to find the year, 17. So what are Mikado flows? They're shear flows, but very specific shear flows. If you take the box, the original box, you truncate it at length lambda q plus 1 inverse, which is the only length that you should have in view of, uh, uh, sorry, it's the smallest length that you should have in view of property 4. And now you blow up one of these things. And on this blown up thing, there's a tube. 
this is the direction xi, and this is a cross section of the tube. So it's a cutoff which is acting, if this would be the EZ axis, it would be only acting in the radial direction. And if this was the EZ axis, it would be axis symmetric. Okay? It has zero mean, so, so there's some flows like this, there's some flows like this. And why does this solve Euler? <laughs> well, let's write down what that means, the divergence of Xi. Okay, let's actually write what this is. This is equal to Xi, Xi dot grad. These guys oscillate in the directions orthogonal to Xi, not in the direction of Xi. So this is zero. Now, this is of course periodized. So there's a... That's why we insisted to have rational directions. Because <laughs> we want to periodize them and not to become dense. So this obeys all the properties except six. Because if you check how small is this object, in this direction, it's a, it's a very long periodized tube. If you were to undo the torus and you view it on R, it would be an actual tube. It's very, or it's order one in this direction, and it's order lambda q plus one to the minus two in this direction. So this is exactly two-dimensionally small. And by the way, it's also incompressible. This is an exact solution of Euler. This is just a shear flow. Okay. <coughs> so this doesn't work because we need more than 2D. So what's next? This is where the intermittent jets come in. The natural thing to make it three-dimensionally small would be to cut it in this direction. To introduce some kind of smooth cutoff. At some scale, doesn't have to be like this one, right? This one is, it just needs to be a bit more than 2D. So minus something, you, you, you can cut it, right? But you introduce a fast cutoff. All of a sudden, these terms will matter a lot. These terms are in no way pressures. Because if you take the curl of this expression, you will get something huge. They're not pressures, so you can't hide them. So there's something fundamentally wrong with cutting them. You, it just doesn't solve stationary Euler. And the punchline is, this guy is not our enemy, it is our friend. If instead of saying it's a pressure gradient, what if you say it's the time derivative of somebody? What does that mean? If this blob of fluid would move in this tube, it's a network of tubes which are periodized, would move at some kind of linear speed, you could make this a time derivative. And that's what I want to convince you of. And then we're going to add one more corrector, which is going to be called a temporal corrector, which is designed exactly to cancel this. So the intermittent jets will basically have these networks of tubes in which there are these ellipsoidal fluid parcels, 
which move through these tubes at some incredible speed. And this is the temporal oscillation that I'm gonna, I mentioned earlier, and now I'm going to have to introduce it. So, for the sake of clarity, let us denote xi to be easy, so that I don't have to tilt things. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce two new parameters, which have to do with the parallel length and the perpendicular length. The perpendicular length will be related to this parameter r perp, and the parallel length will be a parameter r parallel. And what I'm going to define them to be is as if these were order one. So, uh, let me just write them because then... So I introduce a cutoff of phi we've used already. Uh, phi. <laughs> R perp. It's a cutoff in the directions perpendicular. If you want to make it radial, make it radial. Why did I normalize it like this? Because the L2 norm of phi R perp is invariant. It's the same as the L2 norm of phi, which I'm going to choose 1. So phi is a bump function on the unit ball. Phi r perp is a bump function on the ball of radius r perp, but with the same L2 norm. So it's a spike. Then I have psi r parallel. And I'm adding t there. And why am I adding t? This is, xi is e3, so this is dz. So this is the guy I'm going to have to deal with. So I'm going to do, actually, you know what, let me do this, and I'll do the time dependence later. Let me just define a bump function right now. It's 1d only, so I need to put 1 half. So I have these two bump functions at this point, and now I will define W. <coughs> these bump functions that I have there have small support, right? So how do I periodize them? I view that support as sitting within the cube of side length 1, and then I repeat. Okay, so those are periodized to unit. That's actually quite important. But my property there was that these are periodic with some different thing. So I need to artificially pump in a periodicity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this is phi r perp of not x1 and x2, but some sigma times x1. And the sigma <laughs> is this one. This is sigma. times, so this cuts in this direction, times the cut in the other direction. Same periodicity, of course. And time. <laughs> and mu is this new parameter. It has to do with how fast these blobs of fluid move through the networks of tubes and they move of course linearly it's t 
and they move in the direction of the tube, which is in this case E3. I've described this, I'm only missing one thing to have an honest definition. I've defined for you what the tube corresponding to E3 is, but there's many of them, right? So I need to put a rotation matrix there. Okay, fine, but I also want this. But in three dimensions, and Laszlo and Saro observed this, and this was used essentially by Iset when he solved the Onsager conjecture, in three dimensions you can put tubes such that they don't ever intersect. So all I have to do is shift these tubes a little bit so that they don't exactly intersect. And you can do this only in 3D. <laughs> in 2D any two tubes would intersect. So I'm not, let me not write this. What's the upshot? Well, since I'm lifting the board, <laughs> it would be smart to write down what they are now. I left the room there to be filled in later, but I might as well fill it now. Um, how much volume do these tubes take, by the way? Well, they take square of that times square of that times this. So they take up volume which is r perp squared times r parallel. That's how much volume there is. So when I will want to estimate this, what I will have is r perp squared r parallel. So whatever I define them to be, this needs to be more than two. And I think this is something that works, it's not universal. Oh, I forgot already, because there's so many choices. 6 on 7 and 4 on 7. This turns out to work. Uh, the first one squared is 12 over 7, which is not quite 14 over 7, but when you add the other one is 16 over 7, 16 over 7 is definitely more than 2. So this will be check. So now, I still have maybe a bit more than 10 minutes, but not much more. So let me now convince you that these intermittent jets, we call them jets because they move like this, actually obey those seven properties. And then I'm going to try to convince you of the fact that this combination saves this term. Okay, and then I think I'll stop. So, property one, normalized to unit size. Well, yes, of course, they're normalized. Okay, you have Fubini, integration in this direction times integration in this direction. Second one, the supports don't touch. Again, you just shift the tubes a little bit, the supports don't touch. Third one, this is periodic with that scale with those properties. So let's check what is sigma. So for us, sigma is lambda q plus one r perp, which with these choices is lambda q plus one to the one over seven. One over seven is definitely less than one. And lambda q plus one to the one over seven will definitely beat L to the minus 5 by making alpha tiny. L to the minus 5 will be 10 alpha. So if I make 10 alpha less than 1 over 7, I'm good. Next, a gradient should not cost more than lambda q plus 1. OK, so let's hit it with a gradient. If the gradient is in x1 or x2, it lands here. What do you pay? So D1 and D2, acting on cost, this times 1 over that. How about D3? It's a bit less, right? Because you still pay this cost 
from periodization, but you're dividing by r parallel. And this is much less than that, because with this choice, the quotient is 2 sevenths, so it's 5 sevenths. The fact that this is slower is very important, and the next property will show you. The divergence is E3 dot, right? It's D3. So the divergence will cost that much. The curl will point in those two directions. The curl will cost much more. So while this object is not incompressible, it's to leading order incompressible. And that means we can add a small perturbation to make it incompressible. I've already convinced you of the support. And of course, I cannot convince you of this. But what I can convince you of plus dt of something. Because as I said, for stationary, you can't do it. Essentially, what we're building is not a stationary solution of Euler, but a time-dependent solution of Euler by hand, essentially, to leading order. So let's do the computation. With this building block, let's compute the divergence of E3, W, E3, tensor E3, W. Ah, let's just do it in general. Why am I even bothering? <laughs> so this is xi, xi dot grad, w xi squared. Xi dot grad, which in this case is E3, cannot land on phi, right? So this is xi, phi sub psi squared. So I'm not writing, I'm just to emphasize that it's related to xi. And then xi dot grad, what we've called psi. What is xi dot grad? In this case, it will be d3. It turns out to be equal to 1 over mu dt. This guy didn't depend on time. Neither does this. I've convinced you that this is the derivative of somebody. And that somebody has this beautiful factor of 1 over mu in front. If mu is huge, this object is tiny without a time derivative. Right? So, we need to incorporate a temporal corrector. I will erase the Mikado flows and define the temporal corrector. Right, so there's an incompressibility corrector, and this is the temporal corrector. And it's designed such that its time derivative, the time derivative of the temporal corrector, will balance the time derivative coming from the principal part. So I think it should be 1 over mu sum over xi. It should be incompressible, so let's write a literary projector of Psi, it's exactly what I have there. Well, which is exactly W Psi squared. Okay, let me. Okay. okay. So this is, I, I just define this object. How much L2 norm does it contain? Well, it's 1 over mu times the L2 norm of this. Keep in mind, these are squareds. So this is like the L4 norm to the 1 half. And this guy is spiky. So the L4 norm is much larger than the L2 norm. But you have the 1 over mu to help you. And if you choose mu properly, I can guarantee that this has L2 norm, which is tiny. Because 
the loss you have from growing from L2 to L4, think of Bernstein, is accommodated by choosing mu very large. Now, dt of wq plus 1 plus, plus what? The term I have erased. Should I should have the amplitudes inside. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. That's very important. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. So plus what? So the guy we were afraid of is this one. When the divergence hits the high frequency object, this is what we were afraid of. And what I will try to convince you now is that this is a pressure gradient. The Leray projector of a function is the function minus the gradient of the inverse Laplacian of the divergence of the function. So it's a, the function minus a gradient. So dt of this is a gradient, I'm not even going to bother writing it, minus dt of this. And this guy, by our computation, is positive 1 over mu. Do they cancel? Well, not entirely, because the time derivative could get on A. But that's going to be slow. <sighs> and what's the only term I never talked about? Should I do this? I'll do it. I'll erase the parameters. You see, when I wrote this, I've somehow hid under the rug that this divergence could have landed there. Right? So let me add it. So also need to worry about So as I said that's one of the guys Am I allowed to write projection on non-zero modes for a function minus its mean is that okay? That's one term that I never talked about. And there's actually other terms coming from the fact that we've added this temporal corrector. So for instance, we never said what happens when dt <coughs> falls on the principal part. We said what it happens with dt on the temporal corrector. But we never said what happens to it on the principal part. We also never said what happens to the Laplacian of the temporal corrector. Everything else is noise. These actually matter. Now, of course, these have to be hit with an inverse divergence. All of these. And so is this. Okay, let 
me convince you that all of these are good. How about this guy? Inverse derivative of the Laplacian of the temporal corrector. This costs a gradient. I need to estimate this in L1 because it's a stress. How much does the gradient cost? At most, lambda q plus 1. Right? Times the L1 norm of the temporal corrector. Modulo of the fact that the ray projector is not bounded on <coughs> L1, so there's some log losses, it's the L1 norm of this, which is the same as the L2 norm of that. But I have a 1 over mu. So, if I make my speed much larger than lambda q plus 1, this term will be obliterated. So you should ask, well, can I choose mu to be anything I want? And the answer is no, this term will force you. Inverse divergence would gain you a frequency. So it's going to gain, because this is high frequency, right? The temporal derivative costs something, costs a mu. And there's still the L1 norm of this, which I can only bound with the L2 norm. So, what am I missing? Please, somebody. I mean, I know what, but uh, I. I uh, it's again this trick, L1. And I've written here the L2 norm. <laughs> I need to get the support. These things are thin. Support to the one half. Without it, you're screwed. Okay, so let's check. Does there exist a mu which obeys both of them? Because it seemed, without writing this, that these are contradictory, right? So, the answer is yes, because this is more than lambda q inverse. So, this says that mu should be more than lambda q plus 1, but less than lambda q plus, two, uh, plus 1 squared. So, mu... If you take it more than lambda q plus 1, this is small. And if you take it less than lambda q plus 1 squared, this is small. So you're good. We took it 9 over 7 in the paper. Whatever. How about this? <laughs> I left it last. Well, they're both of them, right? Whether you have... Well, actually, no, no, no. This is actually much smaller because it has a 1 over mu in front. The dt falls on the slow guy. It costs an L but you gain a mu. That just destroys it. So, I have left last the most dangerous term. It doesn't look like it. And this is the term for which intermittency does not come for free. In Euler, if you remember, when the gradient hit the slow guy, that actually allowed us to go to Onsager one-third directly. This was the best term in Euler. And the reason was that the minimal frequency in the square was lambda q plus 1. But now it's not lambda q plus 1, it's the sigma. So when I invert the divergence, I don't get lambda q plus 1. I get the minimal frequency of the square, which is sigma. And, well, Okay, it still works because of this. Sigma still beats. So the sigma gain you have from the fact that this has frequencies only larger than sigma and you apply a negative one order operator against the loss, which is an L to the minus five, it's still good. But if you try to improve the scheme and get more regularity, that's the enemy. Okay, so I'm going to close now because I think I've given the idea 
But let me just say in closing that to construct these, in all the schemes, you construct very non-physical things, but underneath the proof, you're actually finding by hand rich families of either stationary solutions or time-dependent solutions of your PDEs. So under the hood, you're actually solving the PDE in a classical sense, but it's just under the hood. And I'll finish with that. Thank you very much.